Hi, warm welcome to the Adda. So lovely to have you. I must say, is, you know, just for everybody to know, this is the first time we're doing an Adda in the morning. Um, yeah. And uh, especially in a cold winter morning, uh, 9.45, we're at 10.15 now, but 9.45, 10 a.m. is, for a newsroom, it's actually like 6 a.m. If you ask for an, an Indian newspaper newsroom, like 10 a.m. is as good as 6 a.m. for the normal person. So. So we want you to clear the fog uh, for us uh, and also maybe generate some heat for us uh, in the winter. So I think what I would like to start with, so we had a conversation, we had an adda with, with, with Prashant now two years ago. That time it was still the uh, end of COVID, so it was not a physical event, it was an online. I think it was our last online adda. And he gave this one kind of a thing which he's very good at, you know, he just these short uh, statements. He gave this one statement which said the success of elections is four M's. He said uh, it's the message, I mean, I hope I get this right. Uh, it's, the, it's the message, the messenger, the machine, and the method. Mechanics. The mechanics, the mechanics, the machine and the mechanics. These are the four M's that he said, if you get three of these four M's right, uh, that's sort of the way to win an election. Uh, you still standing by that? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to throw a few more M's into, into the... Go ahead. No, no, please. Go ahead. So, <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to throw a few more M's into this equation for 2024. Is it, is it Modi, Mandir and money versus minorities and mandal? No, it's still Am I trying too hard to put this <laughs> see, the, <laughs> the M's on line the up? first side, you're just making three M's. It's only one M. It's Modi. Uh, rest everything, whether it's money or mandir, it's all subservient to brand Modi. Uh, the vote is going to be for or against Mr. Modi, the person, his ideology, his work style, what he has delivered, has not delivered what people think of him, good, bad, whatever. But the vote is, it's very clear, it's in and around Mr. Modi. Mandir, I go to an ex no, Mandir also is subservient to it. If just go to the field today, and just after this hype of Ram Mandir, and remove Modi from the equation, I think most BJP contestants would struggle, despite the all other M's. Okay. It's still Modi is the delta. So, the opposition is therefore always going to struggle because everything else is tough to match just that one main factor of Modi. No, right? that's not true. Uh, opposition is not going to always struggle. I, uh, last time also I told you, never underestimate opposition in India per se. Opposition parties or formations could be weak, but opposition is not weak in India. Just to give you a little longest answer, but you, your audience should understand this. A lot of us, we think that in the last 9-10 years, opposition has been weak and Modi had, Modi led BJP had one way run to the power and control, complete control. That's not true. If you look at data and events closely, I, with my limited understanding, can pick at least three significant opportunities which opposition had when they could have really pushed BJP uh, on, the back, uh, on the back foot. The first one is start right early in 2015. A lot of us, we have forgotten. The government was still new. They were still to find their feet. There was nothing much to write home except for early success of Jandhan and a uh, little bit of ground chatter about Swachh Bharat and uh, yoga. And BJP faced election and in 2015, they had a massive setback in Delhi, in January 2015, when Aam Admi Party won 67 out of 70 seats. That followed up, the moment came in November 2015, when the first experiment of all opposition parties coming together against BJP happened successfully in much talked about Bihar election. So the moment, the first moment opposition had against this dispensation was November 2015 and the following months, when on the back of the Delhi defeat, BJP was defeated in Bihar, government was yet to find its feet, 
and this is the first time when senior leadership in last 10 years has gone public again criticizing or questioning at least the leadership of the present BJP yeah. dispensation. But what happened post Bihar, four months BJP went on to lose Bengal, Tamil Nadu and all other elections, they, but they saved by Assam. So Assam was one thing which allowed them to come back. And then they went on to win Bihar. So the first phase for opposition was November 2015. They could have easily got back into action. But at that time, most of the opposition leader would say they were chilling that Modi has just come. Sooner he will become unpopular and we will have our days back. So that was the first big missed opportunity. The second one came immediately after demonetization. Mm. Demonetization led to massive unrest, economic unrest, stagnating, uh, stagnation on rural wages and farm distress. And that was reflected in the political developments in 2018, 17-18, where on the back of this demonetization led economic distress, massive social uprising in Gujarat, particularly the Patel Andolan, so much so that a weakened Congress almost went on to defeat BJP, if you remember, in this November, December 2017. BJP lost Karnataka. Then they went on to lose three states, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh. So the whole year, like 2015, they didn't have single victory. Between January 2014 to May 2015, almost 15 months, First episode, BJP did not get any victory. S somehow they just managed Assam, and which was a purely a mistake of Congress that time. They did not handle their internal affairs yeah. correctly. They went with old guard, Mr. Gogoi, who was facing three-term incumbency, and that allowed BJP to come back. Similarly, in this phase, which started post-demonetization, and data will tell you, economy was in trouble. There was rural dis uh, unrest. Farmers' distress, rural wages stagnated, and on top of that, political setback in Be Gujarat, then Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan. Everything BJP lost. But Congress made major mistakes again because in the, what happened in following four months, they missed out on taking on two key allies of uh, NDA of that time. One was ever-changing Nitish Kumar yeah. and Shiv Sena. If you go dig deeper, your political journalist uh, reporters will tell yeah. you that both Shiv Sena and Nitish Kumar were almost willing to sift to the UPA side. The, next, the second mistake BJ, uh, Congress did in election going into 2019, they did not join the alliance of BSP-SP, which was a formidable thing in UP. If, only if Congress would have joined that alliance, it would have, been, it would have made a difference, at least to another 15-20 seats. And so they allowed this second thing to go. And they thought that Chokidar Chor has, they looked Rafael as the next before. Yeah. So this was the second missed opportunity. Mark you, every episode I'm mentioning, it's a 15 months period. So opposition had those first 15 months in 15, running uh, January, starting January 15 to May 2016. Then they had their opportunity starting mid 2018 till uh, uh, end 2019 sorry, mid-2017 to end 2018. And then the third opportunity they got was post-Bengal in 2021. Imagine the COVID, everyone was distressed, anxious. They lost the high decibel Bengal election. And as the results were coming, the second wave was hitting India. And the first time data will tell you the Modi's personal popularity took a significant dip almost 20 percentage point. Then what did opposition do? Nothing. So it's not that so opposition, opposition, is three or opposition three. never had these opportunities, but you know, as we say in cricket, you have to take your chances. You have to convert even half chances. Here you have three full 15, 12 to 15 months time period yeah. when BJP was on back foot. They had no way to go. You were on top and you just simply allowed them to make a comeback. And if you allow these things to do, as in cricket we say, if you drop three <laughs> catches of a good yeah. batsman, he's going to make you pay. And that is what is happening. Yeah. 
you know, you, you... So please don't say that BJP has not been under pressure. Don't say that people are all in awe with BJP, everyone is for them. People right from the day one opposition, those who are opposed to BJP right, for right or wrong reason, they have tried, they have given opportunity. It's simply opposition parties hasn't taken it. And the, or the formations, they have not been able to capitalize on it. And, and that's why they are facing a situation where to lot many of us is looking that there is no way out, at least in near term, in next five to six months' time. And, you know, one of the things that the reason opposition doesn't get its act together is a lot of internal issues in the, in, in the parties, right? I mean, maybe there aren't internal issues in TMC or in, you know, the regional parties, but no, in no. the Congress… Tell me, tell me, uh, Anand, when Bihar was won in 2015, BJP lost Delhi yep. in January. They lost in November 2015 Bihar. So whole year, they did not win a single election. BJP senior leadership of that time, they went public, please check the records. They questioned the leadership style and how BJP is now run. Fast forward four months, they lost Bengal, they lost uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, all four states, but for Assam. Just imagine if Congress would have been able to hold back, held ground in Assam. What, what did it require? It required Congress at that time to manage their internal affairs, yeah. Gogoi versus Hemant exactly. Sarma, little better. You know, again, I will give an... In tennis, in a five-hour match, there is one point which you miss and you lose. So what if... I so it's not only a function of, you know, too many parties, yeah. too many... Content. It was at that time, I remember distinctly meeting Congress leadership. I came with Mr. Nitish Kumar at that time and we were literally begging them that please, for God's sake, Put your effort uh, in Assam, BJP must not win Assam. If that happens, then it will be a major setback. They did not put their act together. No, and so it was only for Congress to win Assam or to yeah. hold Assam. No, but so I think the internal issues is one of the reasons that the opposition is not getting its act together. What I'm trying to, is what you're also saying is that... It's a leadership. Know, leadership failure. When you get a chance, you have to make it count. But as are, simple as this. But aren't there also internal issues in the BJP? Of course, I'm telling you, these internal issues have surfaced. Yes. But internal issues will come up on the surface only when they are on the back foot. When you are yeah. dominating, then again. You know, in Delhi, for instance, right, there was a whole talk when they imported a chief ministerial candidate who wasn't from the ranks. There was a lot of rebellion, there was a lot of unhappiness amongst the old RSS workers, the BJP people, for supporting a new face. See, these things in politics, Dissent, rebellion, dissent yeah. is, is always there. When going is good, you are able to manage it better. If going is tough, then it's not, go, it's not going to be easy to manage because people are not seeing their future there. But is there a threat in the BJP internally now? Not threat as in terms of sabotage, any no. of that. I'm not going no. to those words. No. But you know the way that Shivraji, Vasundraji... No, nothing. Until and unless they are pushed electorally on the back foot, no internal dissent will come to the surface, no matter how much you talk and how much merit is there. Maybe the truth is there, what you're saying, but it, for it to come on the surface, they need to take an electoral setback. So what and those, when the electoral setback happens, then opposition has to be on their toes. They have to make them count. Then only this dissent you can benefit from. No, what if we frame this differently, the opposition's predicament? So, uh, what if we say that the opposition has not yet found the language to take on the Hinduism or Hindutva of the BJP. No, let me just finish. So, you know, they've tried, let's say, four different tacks. One is this, they've said caste, mandal. Second, they've said secular concerns, whether it's COVID or it's unemployment or it's price rise. Third, they've said, uh, uh, you know, this alliance math that we'll just get together, we'll make these Mahagad Bandhans and that will take care of it. Fourth is the Me Too Hindutva, that I, I will also be Hindu and I will wear the Janeul and I will go to the temple. So these are the four tacks that they've tried to take on the BJP's Hindutva. Do you think the answer is a fifth one or do you think it's a combination of these four? I, I think we are missing the jungle for the wood. I know a lot of people in, sitting in Delhi, they are too obsessed with this idea of Hindutva, Hinduism, which are... Let's take fact as it is. Let's say those who believe in BJP's Hindutva, they are with them. 
But even if they are with them, let's take that there is a lot of people who are fans of Mr. Modi or their voter and admirers of him. They have the organization, they have the message, machinery, everything. But put together, they are only 38. The 100 people who went to vote, only 38 voted for BJP. The remaining 62, despite the message, despite Hindutva, despite uh, organization, despite the muscle, uh, electoral and financial muscle, they were still opposed to BJP. Now the challenge is, is to how to get the majority of this 62. One way to look at is simply those who are, I would say, being lazy, they are just saying that all who got 62, they come together in the room and then hence we will get 62. The approach being followed in this India thing. It's not going to work because you don't only have to bring people and the parties together, you also have to build synergy between them. Synergy in terms of narrative, synergy in terms of their grassroots efforts, synergy in terms of their uh, campaign on the ground. Merely putting people together are not going to give you 62. So if I am advising someone who is fighting or trying to fight BJP, I would say that let's keep this 32, even add 2% more to BJP and say that 40% are not going to vote for us. But there is still a denominator to play. And that denominator is 60%. How do I get 60% of that 60%? That gives me 36, 37% vote and that will bring me in contention. When you, once you are seen in, in the reckoning, then you will see the cracks emerging out of that 38 also, whether it's supporter, cadre, or the leaders, what you mentioned. But unless you cross 30, nobody will find courage to come and join forces with you. So I wouldn't spend time how to counter with, uh, Hindutva. I would say how... How do I first galvanize who are not convinced with this Hindutva? Then I will get into the nitty-gritty. Can I educate more people, enlighten and take 5% of those who believe in BJP's version of Hindutva and those who are not convinced about their version of Hindutva? But there is 60% who are not convinced with them. Why are we not working with them? The Mandir, Mandir didn't take 38. You don't think Mandir has taken 38% to 50%? No, certainly there was no mandir in 2019. No, no, there was no mandir now, in 2014. Now, saying, now post mandir, that See, 38 isn't getting again, more consolidated. My sense is mandir is a very big issue. Has been made now a big issue. It is a big issue, big chatter point. It will certainly, it is, it will enthuse BJP cadres, supporters, voters, and to that extent, maybe the polling percentage will be higher. To that extent, probably the dissent would be crushed within BJP ecosystem. Yeah. To that extent, probably people will be more enthused to go and vote. But it is, is it breaking into that 62? Probably not. I do not meet many people who, after 10 years observing, seeing what BJP is doing, right or wrong, and saying that just because Mandir is there, now I'm sifting. I have seen that to my surprise in the case of 370. Hmm. There are far more incremental vote linked yes. to 370 than the Mandir. Sir, if you go and test the data, uh, look at the data, hard data on the ground. That's interesting. There is much more voters, incremental voter that has come BJP's ways courtesy 370 than the Mandir per se. Mandir is more like a steroid. It's not uh, the drug which is going to uh, give yeah. you good health. Yeah. Uh, it's a steroid. Definitely it's an steroid, but not, uh, it's not going to give you an incremental vote. Fair. So to get the 60 of the 60, that you're, how you phrase it, and just to take uh, uh, Vandita's point forward, they, a lot of people use the word secular. That's the way we're going to get the… Is anyone using the word secular? I, sometimes I struggle, I don't find it. No, so the word secular actually become a bad word now because if the opposition uses it, it's used against them. If the, uh, if the government is Oppo used against see, them. See, opposition is not losing because of use or not using secular. Opposition is losing because simply they are not up to the task. They have been, sorry to say, they have been lazy. Five years, you make India Alliance. Just take this example. You made India Alliance for whatever it is worth. You made nine months before general election. Tell me what prevented all these wise men and women who are running the opposition party and part of India Alliance to do the same thing two years back or immediately after Bengal when chips were down for BJP. That was the time for you to make India Alliance if you believed in this. Assume that you forgot two years, you were roaming around in the world, you were not concerned about that, you thought the general election is very far off. Imagine Mr. Modi would have started the Mandir whole making schedule would have done two years back to match it with this January thing. Yes. Now you are crying foul, oh, he has planned it so close to the general election, this, that. But he has planned two years back. What did you do? 
Two years back, you were thinking, okay, we will do it when the general election comes. So, I think they have, and even when you made, just take this example, when they made first meeting of India Alliance, if I recall correctly, it was in June, June 2023. Yeah. June to 2023, and we are sitting now in end, now, today is February to 2024. Second, yeah. India Alliance has not done one single public meeting. The total number of work hours for India Alliance is six days, including tea, coffee served. Six days. You tell me, if Rahul Gandhi can go for a Europe trip for six days, what prevented these India Alliance people to lock themselves in a place and do this six days job and finish it in June itself? Why are you meeting three, once in three months? And that too, before they go to the meeting place, they book their return ticket. So every meeting you hear that so-and-so leader went before meeting ended. Why? Because they had a flight to catch. Just imagine what seriousness but two years you're showing. Ago, two and years. then you and I, we are analyzing whether to call Hindutva, Hindutva. The, yeah, where is the effort? You put an effort, then we get into this nitty-gritty. What's the cause no. that brought them in that room? It's just anti-Modi, anti-BGP. That's the only... The cause is that you, they, everyone wants to survive. It's not anti-Modi. They so want to survive. They want to hold on to the so that's ground. Not a, that's not a consumer-facing cause, no? Like, I want to survive. That's why we're meeting. I mean, I mean what, is the con what, is the, what is the bid to the voter? Why should the voter... Uh, you know, what is that one thing, that one agenda point, like you were saying, that puts all these... No, they have not together. been able to put that agenda point. That's why they are struggling. So what should That's it be? What saying. should it be? If it's not secular... Uh, if I, it's I not don't know. I'm not... I'm Luckily, I'm not in a space there where I have to advise what it should be. But certainly, what is appearing on... What is very clear to us, that they have not been able to put that narrative, agenda point, whatever, that would have galvanized the so what, country. What, what could it be? Is it unemployment? Is it secular? Is it... Uh, well, jobs, well being, is it, well I don't being, know, what is it? Well being of vast majority of Indians. That has not necessarily improved, not by the, uh, as much as what government claims. And there is a, there is a quite a bit of unrest on that count. Well being in totality, now well being of people in Delhi and well being of people in Bihar are two different yardstick. Yeah. Their aspirations are different. But in general, the well-being of vast majority of Indians is not necessarily as, as good as what government is claiming. And that should have been the opening for the opposition. But the economy is doing very well. By no, not, no, no, no. I don't think so. So You, you look at the data that has come yesterday. 60% people who make less than 5,000 rupees are saying that economy has worsened. Their economic situation has worsened. So which data are you are talking about? So the trickle-down is a problem. No, it's not trickle-down. Those who are... Rich, 25% of them, even 25% of them also have said that economic situation has worsened. But those who are making less than 5,000, 61% of those who are making 5,000 or less per month are saying that in last 10 years economic situation has worsened for them. So where is the, um, but, but see, if there is a f field and uh, there is paddy, that is not going to fill your stomach. You need to harvest that yeah. Uh, paddy for you and convert it into rice and cook it for yourself to eat. So there is a lot of distrust, a lot of unrest, a lot of dissent, but somebody need to, and that's the role of a political formation yes. or a party in a democracy. People on their own, they cannot do it. They will do it, but if they do it, then it will become like a street-based uh, revolution. You yeah. said the opposition should have started two years ago. Two years I ago just give one example. Yeah, yeah, they would have done so many other things. But you have been now doing your Bihar Yatra for the last, what, 17 months. So yes. two years ago, were you not advising some of these same leaders no. of the opposition? No, I see, I'm talking to you. Am I advising you? <laughs> if we are chatting, we will, you know, I will sit with Anant and what... Uh, Indian Express should be doing. We can have a free-floating yeah, yeah. chat, but that's which not has happened. <laughs> which, which happens. Uh, uh, so, no. Post Bengal, I have spoken to a lot of people, including Congress, great length. Much of uh, is known in the public domain. But after that, I have realized that they are not necessarily. They want to do it, but they want to do it their way. Unfortunately. I, in my limited understanding, there is no way I could do this. Be, uh, something different, following the same way what they are following. In your yatra, you speak a new 
kind of language. You basically, you berate the voter. You tell the voter that you are not voting, keeping your child's future in mind. And that's why you're getting the kind of politics and policy that you're getting. You're getting the polit politics of caste and religion because you are not voting for your child's future. So uh, can the voter not actually turn back and say to you that I have a limited menu of options I have to give my, nobody is giving me a better school for my child, so I might as well vote for somebody who's giving me the temple or somebody who's, give, who's my own caste person. Yeah. So, no, so, and also, since you've been on the other side of the fence as well, have you, when you were advising these people, did you not tell them to talk about people's children and their future? Well, <laughs> first of all, you're comparing two different things. When I was advising these people or the party, they are established parties. So advising an established party or making something from scratch are two different approach, I would say. Uh, what you're saying that I'm telling people that just think about your son more than your religion, more than your caste, more than what India, uh, where India should be. You think about where your son should be, where your daughter should be. And that's the approach after one year of study in Bihar. I found that this is something that could help us push people to think more uh, mm, uh, rationally than emotionally. And that is why I'm making, taking this approach. Whether it will work or not, I don't know, because I have not formed a political party. But I have, what I've designed in Bihar and what I'm doing 16 months, almost 4,500 villages I have lived, I've literally walked uh, uh, with Mahatma Gandhi as an inspiration. It's not only I'm putting his picture. You look at Gandhi in the first 20 years of him returning to India. Uh, he did not talk about, uh, you know, uh, uprising against Britishers. He talked about self-reliance, self-awakening. And unless and until you build those virtues or at least reinforce those virtues among the masses, you not be able to make people behave fundamentally different than what they have been doing. So my approach in Bihar is long term. I'm starting from scratch. I've given myself two years at least to first have enough number of people who pay attention to this and like that, no, this is right. India will grow, but it's not necessarily giving job to my son. So I'm saying be selfish. If you if you hear my speeches, I say on the voting day, you must be selfish, the most selfish person on the earth, which is antithesis of what leaders say. Leaders say vote for nation. Leaders say vote for society, vote for caste, vote for uh, anything, vote for mandir, vote for uh, uh, betterment of uh, make India strong or punish Pakistan or China. I am saying vote for your child. That's the whole message. That unless you take care of your child, Nothing is, going to, not, nothing is going to matter because India could grow and still you could, your child could go hungry. So you need to be selfish, you need to be thinking about your child because this, what I think, this is the only way that would probably help them break this cycle of exploitation uh, in the name of caste and religion. Whether it works or not, all of you, in my, with all humble, you know, you have to give me one more year and see, maybe I, it will boomerang. But I certainly am following a different approach. Whether it will give result or not, that time will tell. But I'm, what I have seen in last 16, 16 months, it is working. It's working in the sense that I go to a village which is, say, 90% Yadav. And I say this, that Laluji is not interested in caste. And people are a bit shocked. Are you saying Laluji is not doing caste-based politics? I say, no, he's not doing caste-based politics. Because where he has said that uh, a Yadav community guy will be the chief minister of Bihar. He is saying that my son will be the chief minister of Bihar, all Yadavs should vote for me. So it is not a caste-based politics, it's a politics based on uh, politics for his son. So if Laluji is entitled to take care of his son or be bothered about his son more than the community, you as Yadav are also entitled to first think about your son, then thinking about the other community and people love it. And I see it on, visually people love it. They don't, uh, otherwise I would have been thrown out. If I say this thing that Laluji is doing politics for his son, you say this in Bihar, before me, people would have said that, you know, you'd be chased from the village. And I move without security. I don't take any assistance. I, I do this free-floating discussion on the roadside. 
and nobody has uttered a single word, derogatory word. If any, whether they will vote for me when we'll form the party, that's a different story. But there is so much appreciation which I hear and see and feel. And again, I say it's an hypothesis which we are trying to test. I, I'm willing to give my three years of my life to test it. But if it works, it, will, it can give you dramatically uh, different result than what people have been seeing till now. We can spend some time on how much the voters' thought process has changed in the last 10, 12 years, you know, since you've been advising and till now you're actually becoming an activist yourself. You know, has anything changed? Because, you know, we all believe that the voter is very with us or against us. You're either pro-Hindu, you're anti-Hindu, you're pro-minority, you're pro-caste, you're pro-your caste, you're not your caste. So, has the voters, what the voter wants from the politician, has that changed or is it still the same that's always been? Woi roti kapra makan, mera kya? See, the voters are not separate class. They are merely reflection of, so they are a subset of society. Yes. So, as society change, the voters will also change. If earlier society was consuming information through inlands and postcards. Today, so in society, we are consuming more information through Facebook, Insta and Google. So voters are also consuming. The voters are not different entities. If there is caste in society, then there will be caste in politics. If there is decline in moral values in society, you will see that happening in politics as well. So I do not... Uh, see it as a standalone phenomena that voters are, it's not that I understand. me, Prashant Kishore, as an individual would have a different rules to live my life and as a voter I would have a different rules to live by. If I'm in society, people are getting more radical, it will also reflect in the voters' behavior. So, but, okay, so, but let broad me... trend, if I look at real macro data, I don't see a major shift, behavioral shift or ideological shift in, in India. Even for this Hindutva thing and some of the news that comes that disturbs a lot of people, it's not new thing. This Hindu-Muslim divide is not something that has, ha that has yeah. started happening in the last four years or ten years. This was always there, almost like more than a century ago. It's just that some of those elements who otherwise were not uh, saying these things or doing these things on the street are finding or getting emboldened in a supportive environment to come and say those things more loudly on social media or on the streets. But it was always there in society. The, some of the ideological, uh, I would say, fault lines between Hindu-Muslim always existed. Leaders of that time, sometimes they managed it well, sometimes they inflate it. But I wouldn't say that just because BJP is in power, now Hindus have started uh, hating Muslims or Muslim, Muslims are less trusting Hindus. That's not the case. It was always there. Some elements of them are feeling emboldened in a support, quote unquote, in a what would be seen as a somewhat supportive environment for such utterances and acts on the street. To what degree has society changed by the leader? To, and to what degree has the leader reacted to what society has changed? So, so to some degree, you know, every, every, every political leader says, now this is how I am going here, so we have to talk about this issue. We have to capture that. See, this is to again, some degree, does Modi, is he able to actually move the needle on how society no, thinks only? Not, he, not really. Data does, is not supportive of that. Look at how much votes here. Forget about when you, from morning to evening, you are watching these Hindi news channels, which are just propagating only one... All the news channels are just propagating one line. Just look at the hard data. BJP has got 38% vote in last election, in 2019. That was their peak, at least till now. In India, we have 80% Hindus. Simple mathematics will tell you that 80, 38 out of 80 is telling you that less than half Hindus are voting for BJP. Yeah. So, I don't see a titanic shift in... Hindu, as a society, as a community, we are getting more radical. Yeah. All of a sudden, we have started hating Muslims. We want Hindu rashtra. No, no, no. The, maybe over the last 30, 40 years of effort of Sangh at societal level has moved the needle from 40% Hindus to 45% Hindus. It takes a lot more effort and time than what we think. The moment it crosses 55%, make no mistake, then you... I would start paying attention to the call of Sanatan Dharma, Hindu Rashtra and all. You need minimum 55 to 60% Hindus to be following and buying that idea. 
Because the moment you have 60% Hindus voting for BJP, you're talking about 48% plus vote. But even though it looks from 45 to 55, only 10 percentage point, it could take 20, 30 years. And if there is a counter, then it could go down again. So it has taken almost 50 years plus effort on the part of Sangh to have this level of, uh, I would say, not polarization, but uh, Hindus coming together under the idea as professed by Sangh, Hindu ideology, but still they have not crossed 50 percent. That's, uh, so I, and just compare this data from 2014 to 2019, BJP got 31% vote. So roughly about 40% of that 80. It has just, in five years, it needle has moved less than one percent, percentage point. So is the other stuff sticking? So it, it doesn't move as much as uh, what yeah. the TV news channels. No, fair. It's but very difficult the, thing to do. Is the other stuff sticking for the voters? The voters say that India, we want to vote for India to be the third largest economy in the world. Does the voter really want that? Does the voter want this idea of global pride? You know, um, you know, the, you know, are these things, you know, does the voter care about these things as much as we believe? They, or they, we they do. They do. They don't necessarily vote because of this, but they use this as a reason to justify what they are doing. So there is a lot of hardship. Somebody goes and tells that, you know, how your life has changed. Your, your life has not changed. Why are you voting for Modi? They say, okay, my life has not changed, but at least he has made India a third largest economy. Yes. So these reasons, people use more to justify their voting pat behavior rather than being guided that, oh, India is going to be third largest economy. Till date, I was voting for communists. Now I'll vote for BJP. It doesn't work that way. But those who are voting for BJP, they find reason to justify why they are voting for BJP, which itself is a big thing because if they hold on to 38% vote, it's very difficult to defeat. Since we are talking of uh, what voters vote for, so this… Uh, I, 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 you don't make <laughs> me the gyan, <laughs> no, all-knowing, but no, I, I'm just… No, since you are also now on the street, you are uh, among the voters now. Whatever so, little I understand, I'm sharing. I don't know yeah. what, uh, what voters vote for. So do you think that uh, this whole argument that the opposition puts forward of democracy in danger, constitution under siege. So the ED, CBI, the chief ministers being arrested, opposition leaders being targeted, institutions being controlled. Does that resonate among the voters, you think? It, it does and it doesn't. It does and that's why you see very different results in Lok Sabha versus Bidhan Sabha. You go to the village and you talk to the person that you voted for Modi in Lok Sabha. Why are you voting? for a regional party or somebody else in Bidhan Sabha. Among one of the most cited reasons is we don't want all power in the hands of one person. So it, democracy, centralization of power, the fear of one person becoming so strong, it's you and I may not appreciate, but the common person understands this better than you and me. It doesn't because, uh, because coming to the second, it does, I said, <laughs> It doesn't because India has seen this kind of centralization of power in the past as well. So some of the BJP supporters or voters, if you go and talk about misuse of institution, they will immediately give you the answer, but it has happened during Indraji's time as well. Congress, Congress has also done this. And that's why I said that what Modi is today in voting terms, in political terms, is almost like has become what Indira Gandhi was in 80s for Congress. So people were voting for Indira Gandhi and that has led to centralization and depends on that individual. When you have got that much power, when millions of voters are voting purely basis who you are, then whatever comes to your mind becomes the law. India is Indira, Indira is India. So it's not that if India would have not seen this phenomena before, the reaction would have been that much yeah. bigger. But people have seen this kind of centralization of power and use or misuse. So it's much muted. But no, so it's they, not they, absent. People are aware of it. And it is also backed by data. You look at the Modi's ability to transfer vote, to get vote for BJP in Lok Sabha versus Bidhan Sabha. This is another data point I always highlight. Between 2014 to 2019, BJP's underperformance in assembly elections was close to three percentage point, meaning BJP Despite Mr. Modi's campaigning aggressively, talking about double engine and that vote is coming to me, BJP underperformed by three percentage point. Between 2019 to 2000, now, the BJP underperformance in assembly is almost reaching now nine percentage point. So what, what does it tell you? 
between 2014 and 19 people were blindly voting yeah. not only for modi also to his call whoever he wanted people to vote for it's going down it's going down for two reasons first some of who he asked people to vote for they did not deliver in the eyes of people second his own charisma is probably has taken a little bit of hit and third of what we said people don't want over they are seeing the sign of somebody becoming too strong so sometime in their head they are balancing it it doesn't appear that in a you know obvious but at, at a macro level, it is the balancing on the part of the people. That's how I see it. But then shouldn't, shouldn't BJP and Modi therefore bank more on the local leaders, like a Vasundra ji, like a Shivraji, like a Yogi ji, rather well, than you, kind of… You, you can't be Sevag and Dravid at the same time. You decided what you want to be. And, Can you, uh, not and, be and you can't be a Sonia Gandhi and Indira Gandhi at the same time. Indira Gandhi had her own style and that worked. Sonia Gandhi had her own style that worked, but they, they were for the same party, same ideology, same set of people, they had a very distinct approach. Similarly, what Modi has opted is very different than what Bajpayee ji has opted for Baj Bajpayee Advani era and Modi Sa era is very different. Though they are dealing with the same ideological space, same voter set and everything, but it's a different approach. Now they cannot turn and become a consensus maker like uh, Bajpayee. So, so they have to continue doing what they are doing. And unfortunate or the risky thing about this is, I see the trend only getting more thrill more thriller. Thriller. So, yeah. so somebody asked That's me who will be the, uh, who will replace Modi or who will be the next, uh, uh, who will succeed Modi. And I always say nobody knows and no one should make a prediction. But one thing is very clear, whoever comes after him will be more hardliner than what Mr. Modi is. So would make Mr. Modi look relative on relative basis would make mr modi look liberal than what he or she is going to be no given that's the, very clear directionally it's very clear given the modi model where he gives no space or quarter i wouldn't to call others. it modi model yeah no so given his leadership style or approach that you're talking of what explains the cult of yogi it's nowhere close to mr modi no, but don't it's, make it's, no, no, don't make this mistake no, it's still an exception no no it's, still an exception no, it's not in, an exception but for mr modi mr yogi would not be able to pull off up on his own make no mistake mr modi is still the catch vote catcher all others are there but there's a huge difference huge difference you take out mr modi and have the election tomorrow with mr yogi alone he would find it difficult not yet he has not reached that stage yet he had not, it's like during Bajpayee and Advani's era, Modi was a very powerful leader, very popular leader in Gujarat. But he needed Bajpayee, he needed Bajpayee to keep winning. Now he has reached a stage when he doesn't need necessarily uh, in that way, Mr. Bajpayee or Advani, he can win it on his own. So Mr. Yogi has not reached the stage where he can do it without Yogi, uh, Mr. Modi. That, that, at least that's what, how I think. No, he may not be competing. That with cult him. is in making. Yeah, but that cult is in making. But if he, if he ever becomes big but, enough. But it is not about Mr. Yogi. It is about what I said earlier. It is about having a more hardliner as the face and the leader of the dispensation called BJP Sang. No, among the. It is not. It's not person. -centric. Among the BJP chief ministers, Yogi stands out because there is nobody no, else. No, if you are chief minister of a, yeah. a state as big as UP, you would stand out any which way. Also, who he is, he would stand out. The size. And who he is, his background, his pedigree is making a standout. But you see, all BJP chief ministers are literally competing to appear more hardliner than their predecessors. So today, Madhya Pradesh chief minister or Rajasthan chief minister would appear, would make conscious effort and would make it obvious to the world that they are more Hindutvadi or more closer to the hardliner thought process of BJP than what their predecessors were. So what I'm saying, it is a more of a di directional call. Don't be bothered about who the individual is. Whoever individual comes and takes that position has no option but to behave that way. We're using the word hardliner and you know that, that's correct obviously. But is there also, would you also concede that there is also some element of governance that's actually changed? It's, I mean, would I would even ask the word, would you concede that there's an improvement in governance with these BJP, I, I, uh, I, a couple I, of these I, I, BJP I told names? you that what works for BJP is not only Hindutva. It's, it's a four-layered thing. Yeah. One is this ideological yeah. base, which is Hindutva. 
Second is this hyper-nationalism, neo-nationalism, whatever you want to call it. India has arrived. India is a stronger. India is more respected in the world. We are just about to become Biksit Bharat, yeah. Bisu Guru. That's the second layer. The third layer is Labharthi, what you are saying, mm -hmm. governance, direct delivery of benefits. Whether it's Kisan Swanidhi or Sochale yeah. or piped water or cylinder or 5 kg uh, rasan. These five things have made a difference. Again, has made a difference in maintaining the cult. Right. And then fourth layer is the electoral and the political uh, infrastructure, the muscle they have. Put these four together, they are getting 38-40% vote. It's not one or other. But between four, if you have to still, and Modi is omnipresent, linked to all four. Yeah. Hindu, Hindu, those yeah. who believe in Hindutva, they see in Modi that under him, we Samrat, are, more, Hindu Samrat, we are yeah. better. Yeah. Nationalism, oh, he is the one who is bringing India to the world stage. Labharthi, he is the one who is making us deliver, uh, he is delivering this direct benefit which has never happened before. And the electoral muscle, the organization, the time, effort, resource they are putting, that has also not seen. You, you have not seen, say, Mr. Bajpayee going and campaigning as aggressively as Mr. Modi does. Yeah. So all these things goes into making of this Modi-centric thing. And does the voter... But it's not, if you remove Modi, these four still will hold. Modi might be replaced with some other face, but these four are the founding pillars I see on which the BJP support base is, uh, BJP has based its support right now. Okay, so if you, so if you take a state leader, uh, there is a view that, you know, if they become too big, eventually they kind of, you know, it, this, this idea of functioning doesn't work. They, it has to be Modi prominent everywhere and that's the only way uh, this set up Was it works. the case when Indraji was the Prime Minister? It's the same thing. We have seen this. This country has seen this. This. Let's not, uh, so the voters uh, let's not get too anxious about it. Again, the peop I'm not one of those who believe that, you know, he's just about to become a dictator and there'll be no elections yeah. and uh, he can take the constitution. But no, it has happened in the past. India is too big and too diverse and people, you have to believe in the people's wisdom. They're not fools. Nobody, no individual, no matter how strong he or she is, is able to steamroll 1.3 billion Indians, no matter, no, of course. No, no, no matter what comes. Yes, there could be some period of turbulence. It could be for individuals or collectively for a group of people. But to say that India will become one of those countries like in Africa where somebody has become dictator and there's no challenge to it, I don't see it. At no, least. I, I could no, be wrong. No, I, I believe that. But I'm, I'm, my, my question is, my question is, how does the BJP stay together when, you know, you have somebody who's delivered, who's done well from the ground, who's so, you sidelined? So, so long they are delivering politically, they will stay together. Like it happened in case of Congress. You know, it, it's a common sense. Again, look at societies. When families divide. When fortunes start falling. Yes. So, so long you are making a lot of money in business also, families are all together. Brothers <laughs> are like... Ram and Lakshman. Yeah. The moment you <laughs> take a hit, you, you have a debt, your business is falling, the both of you start falling, fi fighting. So, same thing happens in politics. Again, same, same thing. Whatever happens in society, happens in s politics as well. So, in your previous avatar, as a strategist who worked primarily in the back rooms, you were described often as somebody who is ideology agnostic. <laughs> Now, now, that still you, being a, now that you have come out onto the street, uh, are you still ideology? See, first agnostic? of all, these, these are the fancy words people use, ideology, ideologically agnostic. I don't know what it means, but I tell you something. Any leader, political, religious, social, they talk so much about ideology because they would like all their support base to get so blinded with ideology that you lose objectivity. So, if you are a BJP supporter, I'm a BJP leader, I would like you to get so intoxicated with ideology that you lose the sense of fairness. So, I'm a believer of ideology of BJP, that means if a poor guy is being lynched on the road, I should not open my mouth because I'm a believer of ideology. The same thing for communists, same thing for Congress. My approach has been, again, whatever little I understand of Gandhi, that do not make subs yourself and your judgment subservient to ideology. And to that extent, yes, I am ideologically agnostic. I do not want to become 
prisoner of ideology and support whatever right or wrong. If I think it's wrong, I must have the courage to go and say it's wrong. Whether it is uh, coming from my ideological base or opposing ideological base. I'm, I don't care about it. And, and what about the Indian voter again? I come back to And I always say and I quote this, uh, give example of Mr. Gandhi. See, Mahatma talked about being vegetarian. The, somebody can just extrapolate and say um, uh, RSS is, he was very close to what RSS is saying that everyone should become vegetarian. He talked about Gram Swaraj. To that extent, he was socialist. He was closer to socialist ideology. He talked about asset ownership, estate ownership of the assets. That way, he became communist and he was in Congress. So, how would you describe Gandhi's ideology and which political party you will put him to? You tell me, I, I will follow that party, I will join that party. See, in a country as diverse as India, you cannot have this one thing casted in a stone and say everyone just follows this in the name of ideology and just to close this argument in the human history worldwide the most heinous crimes have happened all in the name of ideology so please in your quest to push ideology ideology do not make everyone blinded we don't we, we need ram bhakts educated ram bhakts we don't need uneducated and bhakts in the name of ideologies so, moving beyond ideology, and I'm coming back to what the voter wants, is the voter care about loyalty? You know, like, I feel like, you know, it, it's happening in so many state parties coming out of national, they keep switching sides, and obviously... We they should! Oh, God, never even say that vote, voters should become loyal forever, then you will bring the... No, 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 no I'm You'll saying, kill I'm the no, democracy. No, no, what I mean is that... Vote, Nitesh, if like, anything, I would like to see in India more voters uh, shifting from one side to another. Just to give you another example. In southern states, which are seen to be doing better than the northern states on all economic and social development indicators, no individual post-independence has been able to go on to become chief minister for more than 10 years consecutive. Compare Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Telangana, Andhra, no chief minister, MGR, MGR was, but even his tenure had a break in between. So nobody has got three times elected con yeah. continu continuously. Compare that to Bihar, compare that to Odisha, Rajasthan. Some of these states are having people 30 yeah. years, 25 years, and they are the ones who are not progressing that well. So, in our interest, in everyone's interest, yeah. democracy okay. should be alive and kicking. Yeah. Who wins, who loses is a temporary thing. We must not bother. The botheration should be if democracy is, is not being fought. Actually, when I, 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 I was talking about loyalty of the politician. Like Nitish keeps changing sides. Now it's ideology or not, doesn't matter. You know, the Thakres have changed sides. No, voters are smart enough to make this no, distinction. Again, again, I will say... Does the voter want the politician to be wedded to something? Or yes. is the voter indifferent with the guys constantly moving? Voter because ideology wants, is not so important Voter now. wants, and it is reflected in the performance. It's just that in the headline of the news, we are, you're not reading the subtext. Look at Nitish Kumar, who has done the flip-flop, and I hear comment coming from Delhi media, that, oh, he's Teflon coated, without him Bihar is not run. That's not the so-called un-illiterate uh, uh, caste-based society of uh, Bihar has made, take, taken note of this, reduced Nitis from 117 to 42. So Nitis is no longer the political leader and the political uh, sway he used to have with voters in Bihar is no longer there. And one of the major reasons has been his switching sides. So it's not that voter is completely... Uh, ignorant of this or is not taking cognizance of it. You go to any village in Bihar, people will say, oh, he's a Palturam. Even his own voters, even those who are voting for him, they are taking note of this. So then, people who have a strong vote base of their own, would you recommend that they stay in a ship which is, may not be kind of going to rise now, they stay in a sinking ship, so to say, rather than lose their own electoral sort of thing by, by jumping to, a, to the winning ship? By, by changing to the I'm movement. not getting the question. What would I you recommend, would you advise a candidate who has his own vote base, wherever in the country, would you advise him who's considering to ship, to jump ship to the, to the, to the any, winning any, party? Anybody who does politics knows that you don't trade, you don't trade off your core vote. If you do, then you're doomed. Whoever you see as your core voter, like BJP, if they say, I will not, we will, we will not be pro-Hindutva voters, would not be our core voter, then BJP is doomed. There is no way let they me, can build on it. Let me just so similarly, the left-of-center uh, parties who claim to be representing the ideology of left-of-center, 
they must build and invest in the core. Yeah. That is the problem. They, are, they have not invested enough in their core. If the core shifts, then there is no incremental vote. Let me just rephrase a very badly phrased question. Jyoti Aditya Sindhya moved from Congress to BJP. No, 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 give me a sec. Lot of people are considering this, what we hear. Lot of people see, like Jyoti like I'm there, saying, there's Jyoti a Radit million Deoras Jyoti move Jyoti to... Sindhya or individual, they are not institutions. They They're are not individuals. institutions. But they, they, have just, a, they have a vote base. They, they don't have any vote base. They're just migratory birds. They are going which side the wind is going. They are not... Uh, Jyoti no, but they Radit have some Sindhya. vote base. When, when he, since when he has become the grassroots leader, who is Jyoti Aditya Sindhya? Okay. Who is Jyoti Aditya Sindhya? But for his father. And his father drawing from the royalty he is coming from. In, in what is his other pehchan in Madhya Pradesh or in India today? So, Congress was wrong in first rewarding such people. And if you do wrong, you will face the consequences. All these people, the so-called four or five leaders who, which media talks so much, tell me what they have done. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, for some of you would know, he has spent eight years with a steel box and building grass, village level congress committee in 1920s. Just read this book. How many, eight years he has spent doing that. How many of these leaders have gone to a village and built an organization or cadre or sangatan? They straight were brought in as a cabinet ministers because they were son and daughters of so and so. Now you are, you thought that they are the big names, but they are, at best, they are the potted plants. As in her shifts and They are the so. potted plants. That's yeah. it. So long the environment is conducive, it looked good in your drawing room. They didn't have the ability to grow within the natural no. setting. So Nitish is not a potted plant. He's not. But, uh, yeah. So to get back to Nitish, what explains this discrepancy that on the one side, as you said, the people have punished him from 100 and something, he's come down to 40 something. Then what explains the fact that no matter which side he's on, he's the always CM? He's CM because sometimes the arithmetic is such and the calc as, you know, why Nitish gets the CM? Position. I tell you why. It's because why countries in Africa with a lot of mineral resource get more civil wars. Bihar, so like more minerals meaning more people are willing to compromise and uh, to get uh, the riches from that mineral. Similarly, Bihar, UP states, they have become the source of the maximum number of member parliament. So what Congress did with Lalu? Then it's not that Congress leadership, Manmohan Singh, Sonia Gandhi would not know the governance track record of Mr. Lalu Yadav. But still they choose to go with him because they wanted 20, 25, 30 MPs coming from Bihar. Even if it came at the cost of complete uh, failure of the, on the governance front by Lalu. Same thing is BJP doing. BJP has not got Nitish Kumar because Nitish Kumar will get him more vote or seat or etc. Just I, I want to put this on record. BJP is going to lose seats in Bihar in, uh, in Lok Sabha also because they have to now adjust Nitish Kumar so they will be fighting less number of seats. They have got Nitish Kumar because they wanted to kill this perceptional thing that you know there is an opposition alliance or a bloc called India. By taking one of the quote unquote founders of India, they have given a big psychological blow to the opposition uh, uh, side rather than them taking because he is, they cannot win Bihar or they cannot do politics in Bihar without Nitish Kumar. Yeah. So it's a, I would say BJP knows the data and the fact, but it's a strategy where they have decided to lose the battle to win the war. That may, see, if Nitish Kumar is there with uh, BJP, BJP cannot fight more than 20-25 seats. If they would have fought alone with other partners, they would have fought 30-30 plus seats. Now, Nitish Kumar will win more seats because he has to be adjusted, minimum 10, 12, 15. Last time, they fought 17 each. So even though BJP had a 100% strike rate, BJP got only 17 MP from Bihar. So this time, BJP on its own were looking to add to that 17. By bringing back Nitish Kumar, they are going to lose. Then why they would do this mistake? They would do this mistake because even if, say, five less member parliament from Bihar, they will be from NDA but not in BJP, the psychological blow it has given. Now the whole media is talking, India's block is finished. So that is what they have done and they have done it knowingly as talking, India's block is finished. So that is what they have done and they have done it knowingly after the election 
they will treat it very differently. Yeah, so now that the psychological blow has been delivered, yes. do you see in the very near future the BJP swallowing Nitish Kumar and the JDU? They are already swallowing, it's a work in progress. Are they not swallowing him for the last four or five years? They have swallowed him completely. It's only a skeleton left. They, they, they don't need advice from me on these things. They are far more smarter. They will finish him off. You know, by hugging him in 2017, they killed Nitish Kumar, who could potentially emerge as a challenger to Mr. Modi after 2015 victory in Bihar. They hugged him. They made him look like one more leader. And after doing what they have done last time, they have killed him completely. After, they will carry him on their shoulders. So long, there is a little bit of relevance left. After this, they know how to deal with these leaders. They have done it with many leaders in Delhi, both from their own party and outside. So would Nitish they are Kumar, ruthless. They will, would Nitish Kumar not know this? He knows it. So, but it, he is also like at his age, with no support, no party, no resource, no uh, uh, credibility left. He also says that now I have left 18 years, I have been chief minister. One year more, two year more, whatever I can extract maximum out of this. The last drops of juices he's trying to extract. So it is serving the purpose and that's why they have done this deal. Two more quick questions. We go to the audience. There's so many, so many people here and they've been waiting to have a conversation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions also. We're saying BJP is very smart in how they've handled with Nitish. And that's I'm not saying BJP is very smart. <laughs> These are your words. <laughs> Everybody who is ruling, anyone who is ruling India would be a smart. Yeah. No, but I'm saying there must be something. I said they know how to deal with this situation. So there's something that Nitish also must have thought said. when he decided to go back. I mean, is he also seeing the sort of the the shelf life of Mandal coming to an end? Like, is he See, seeing the whole Mandal, Mandal self again in social politics, justice? You guys are much more experienced than I would ever be. Anything, whether it's Ram Mandir or Mandal or Bofors, Jan Lokpal, in politics, in your life, you can use it only once. You can milch it only once. But they've been twice. using Mandal as the main no, plank for which... No, Mandal gave, again, Mandal gave them the result of likes of Mulayam, Lalu, yes. only for five years in early 90s. After that, it has got a diminishing return. Now it has reached a stage when they have talked about caste-based survey, they have increased the reservation to 65%, still Nitis had to run back to Modi. Why? Because that is not going to give you result. That's not going to give you results. Similar, the, as much it holds true for Ram Mandir, it holds true for Mandal, it holds... Imagine Aam Admi Party is starting a Jan Lokpal Andolan today. Any one of here thinks that it is going to give them any vote. It did at one point of time. You can't... You be fresh. Wo kind of ki handi bar bar nahi politics mein. You have to make a new cut ki handi. And then sell it again. And that is where Modi is, has his advantage. In 2002, he was selling Hindu Hridaya Samrat. In 2007, he was selling himself as an able administrator. Uncorruptible means business. By 2011-12, he was selling himself as somebody who can bring, replicate what he did in Gujarat to India. By 2019, he was not selling the same thing. By 2019, he was saying, I'm the one who can take India to its rightful place. I can take on Modi, this whole Pulwama thing. I can, I, 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 I will give India the rightful place in the world hierarchy. By 2024, he's not saying that. He's saying, I'm the one who has brought Ram back to India. So look at his own evolution in, in last 2002 to 2004. Today, people see as if he's, he has brought back Ram after 500 years, Ram is back courtesy Modi. That is his evolution. He's not trying to sell the same thing what he sell, sold in 2002. Yeah. And he knows it. And that's why you see even the government's goal, which is subservient to Mr. Modi's evolution, keeps changing from everyone will have household uh, uh, a roof on their head by 2020. 2020 come and gone. Now you talk about five trillion economy, come and gone. Now you talk about Atmanirbar Bharat, come and gone. Now we are talking about being the top three uh, 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 economy in the world. So it keeps changing. So he's selling a new idea. He's not selling the old one. And since you've worked with Modi so closely before and you've known him, very, very few people I don't like know him. anyone can claim that he, he, yeah, you that, know him, but yes, I've worked long enough, yes, th three years almost. Do you, just the relationship between the RSS and the BJP, how critical is that for BJP to win? 
And what is that relationship now? Is it, is it on ice? Is it wonderfully perfect? Is it always going to be a little bit of squabbles? How do you see that relationship today? In complete harmony. The reason being that the timelines for both are different. So the political leadership, the timeline is most short run. You want to win elections, you want to uh, be in power, you want to do in terms of policy what you want to do. For some, it is more long term, 20 years, 30 yes. years. Take for example, West Bengal. The present leadership took the risk, it would be called as a political risk, and went on to fight Bengal. They lost. So there was some setback to Modi and Shah. But as far as Sang is concerned, it has opened a new frontier. Now there are it's thousands of Sakha, yeah. which otherwise were, would not have been there in Bengal. So by these guys are taking political risk, and they have been able to successfully pull it off, at least till now, which is suiting Sang, because you are expanding their ideology. So if you are having a 20-year timeline, you say, okay, these individuals have a self-life, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. But the ideological expansion from Sang's point of view is... There's only one way, which is it keeps on expanding and expanding and expanding. So that's why there is an harmony compared to a situation, say, Bajpayee Advani. Their approach would have been let Mamta energy be there. We do an alliance, we will not take the risk, it will disturb the ally. That also restricted the expansion of Sangh. So when these guys are taking political risk, they are taking political risk, they are being more, uh, I would say, aggressive. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But Sung is a winner in both cases. So but that's why they are willing to take this short term, what some people say that Sung is against Bhakti Vaad and this and that. They see Bhakti is like, has a self life, 20 years, 30 years, yeah. how long? But Sung and the ideology will remain beyond. And that's why it appears to be more harmonious equation between Sung and the present leadership of BJP versus what a lot of you would have seen, observed, and written between Sangh and, say, Bajpayee Advani era. Very interesting. But, you know, I, and this is my view, whenever I hear any BJP leader, whether it's Modi or somebody else speaking about issues that are little... You are know, you hearing a lot of other leaders? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll say specifically with the Ram Mandir, because I was there and I was paying attention. You know, I felt that, and many opportunities that when the Sangh speaks, when Bhagwaji speaks or somebody else from the Sangh speaks, they sound much more moderate than the BJP leaders. Is that a fair statement to make? You know, in Ram Mandir, we will talk about Don't find uh, mandirs under every mosque. So, when, Don't when, again, I would say, when you see your long-term goal getting fulfilled, you would sound moderate and more benevolent and <laughs> accommodating because your long-term goal is being served. I would say only that much. I, do, I, I don't have more crystal ball to look into what actually is going. I see they are, the only thing I make a distinction is BJP's leadership, is their goal, their targets, their activities are more medium to, uh, short to medium run. As it have to be. And Sung is more medium to long run. And that's why they have a strike this balance because it's win-win situation for both. Uh, in your role as uh, a strategist and activist... I have left the job. Why yeah, do you want to yeah. take me no, back there? In bo <laughs> have, is there anything called the women's vote? There is so much... Oh, huge, huge, huge. What huge. defines the women's vote? How is it different from the men's vote? It is different because women are different. Uh, and uh, increasingly more and more uh, politic, uh, political parties, they win or lose purely basis women vote. In Bengal, I can tell you, hard data, the difference between men and women voting for TMC was 13 percentage point. 13 percentage point. So all the men who think that they control their wife, they are making a big mistake. They are making a big mistake. But some of the um, uh, commentary which I read uh, in papers that because women turnout is more and hence XYZ has won, Please read the data carefully. It's largely a denominator effect. There are less number of women registered as a voter. Hence, sometimes just the voting percentage appears more for the women. Actually, it's not more. And the abs in terms of absolute number of voters who have went to cast the vote, men is still higher because there's lot, there are millions and millions of women who are not registered as a voter. 
Hence, the denominator sometimes gives you an impression that women voted 55%, men voted only 50%, and hence XYZ has won. Please, whenever you look at this number, pay attention to the absolute number. 55% women and 50% men would be all, almost men would be more because the number of women who are registered as a voter is less. It's largely a denominator effect. Having said so, women who are going to vote, they have their own issues, they are much smarter, and they are more, uh, I would say, uh, they are less expressive. So surveys tend to get women preferences wrong because they are smart enough, they are less vocal, but they vote very differently when they go. So they, they, that's why a lot of this exit survey and all this, they get it wrong because the fear factor among women is that much higher. It's there in the general in society, but we have observed in the last 10 years that women tend to hide their their voting preference or behavior closer, much tighter, and you would see invariably closer to the elections, they will come out, and even after exit poll, they, they can fool you coming out and they'll say, oh yes, I voted for you only. Are the concerns and issues different between men and women? In, yes and no, but they are, some, they are the one who are more, uh, like if you go and talk to a uh, female in Bihar, she's more bothered about uh, not getting five kg rice uh, than what is happen happening to, say, India-Pakistan. So there are issues which are different, which are more relatable to their family affairs. But I would see them as a distinct voter vote base, and it's a good thing to happen, good thing that is happening. And, and they are less wedded to caste and all that, right? I mean... Uh, no, I can't say that. No? Okay. I can't no. say that. I, I have no data to prove that. No, because that, I think one of the things that... Whether women are less wedded to caste, no, like the prohibition I, on for the instance, margin, if I have to make a statement, I would say they are more religious. They are they tend to get swayed by the religious issue more than the caste issue. So right. on Mandal, you would see more men agitating yeah. than the women. When there's a Ram Mandar procession, you would find more women doing that kalas yatra than men. So to that extent, I would say. But beyond that, I don't have hard data to. I want to talk so. about American elections also. But I think we're running running out of time. A lot, lot of questions here. So if we have time, maybe we'll get to it later. Yes, please. Tavleen first, then the back there. Yes, please, please. Maybe maybe we'll take two two questions at a time. Please keep the questions short. It's uh, everybody just get to office also. It's a Can I ask two? Are you saying two? Oh no. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I actually have two very short questions. One is when you look at the Indian political landscape at the moment. What gives you hope and what makes you despair? And the other question is, do you think that what is really wrong with the opposition parties is that they're not political parties, but family firms? The second one is rather easy. It's not a question of only them being uh, family firms. To, to some extent, it's right. It's just that they have killed the democratic flow, natural democratic flow that would have strengthened their party. So if you are a young political activist or as somebody who is aspiring to be a politician in UP, Bihar, Odisha, would you look at Congress as a platform? Probably not, because you know that there is a ceiling, it will be only sons and daughters of somebody who has been in the past. So that the biggest this, this service by promoting themselves or their sons and daughters they have done is to themselves, to their own parties. Make no mistake about it. The first one, what gives me hope, I don't see people as intimidated as the have-nots are not as intimidated as those who are well-offs in India. So that's a hope. And they still are the majority. The have-nots in India are still the majority. So... I do not see them being fearful of saying, you go to any village, and I'm sure you are, you are a veteran journalist, you go to a village, a woman would not mince word if she's not happy with Mr. Modi or Akhilesh Yadav or Rahul Gandhi. They don't mind saying what they want to say. Compared to an industrialist, he would always position his response as if, oh, the new God has arrived for, to save the whole in, entire humanity. Uh, what despairs is... Again, link to this, those who have, who are blessed with education, resource, in India, uh, middle, upper middle class, by and large, uh, they continue to be very insensitive to those who, have, who are still uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. So, in India, as a society, we, we, those who are well-offs need to be a bit more 
aware, if not, I'm not saying they should do more, but that's a long shot, but at least they should be aware what their fellow citizens are facing or what they're suffering or what their life is all about. Just because you sit in Delhi, that doesn't mean that whole of India has become the Bisu Guru and there's no problem. We still have close to 750 million people who do not make $2 a day. That's like roughly about 150 rupees. So, and we completely, the 300 million people, middle class, upper middle class, we are creating so much of noise as if everything has changed, everyone's life has become uh, better. That's not the case. Almost 750 million people are still struggling for the basic needs. Just to give you an example of Bihar, people sitting here, you know the old age pension is 400 rupees. 400 rupees. The person has to survive the whole month, everything in 400 rupees. Can any one of us would relate to the kind of life you have to, you'd be living if you have only 400 to live the whole month? And you are doing it for month after month. And people wait for these 400 rupees. The more important thing, they wait for these 400 rupees. And even in that 400 rupees, they have to pay a commission of 10 rupees to get that 390 so that they get the basic medicine or whatever they want to use it for. So not being cognizant of the vast majority of India who is not as well off as we are is probably the point of despair for me. <laughs> the lady in the second row. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I feel like in this neo-colonial world of technological revolution, data today is the newest form of currency, right? Now, when it comes to controlling data politics, I think BJP has absolutely is that act as compared to other, um, other political parties, you know. And even as the opposition says that if BJP comes to power in the upcoming election, which I don't even feel like is a contentious topic anymore, it is going to be the death of, say, the fourth pillar of democracy, that is journalism. So do you think that's the case? No, I don't agree with you at all. And I will disappoint many in the audience here, data and data privacy and all. You know, the technology has made your life, my life, information about us, what we do, what we think, is so open. You don't need to actually spy or steal data of anybody. The moment what you're using your phone, people know what you do first thing in the morning, which song you are listening. So Amazon and Meta and Google has more information about you than what any Indian government could ever procure. So let's, yes, data privacy is essential. You should talk about it. We should have the systems and protocol to protect the interest. But let's not talk about that BJP is winning just because they have got access to data. It has got no merit. You can have, it's like you sit in the best library and still you could fail the exam. <laughs> data per se is not giving you any advantage. You need to know how to, ha how to use it. And data is, look at social media. A lot of people think that BJP has the full control over it. Today, Rahul Gandhi's social media reach engagement is higher than that of Mr. Modi. But still, it's not giving him the result. Why is not giving the result? Because he's not saying the right thing. He is not trusted. So what I told the who is using that data for what is as important. What was important is Mahatma Gandhi, the messenger, and what he said. It doesn't matter whether he's delivered that message on a uh, postcard or today if he would have been here, probably he would have posted the same message on Facebook. It doesn't matter. What matters is who is the messenger and what message he's delivering. We are thinking that only, then though only Elon Musk and, uh, you know, meta owners would, would start ruling the globe. They have disproportionate influence because of the reach of their platform. But they are the not who can change the public sentiment in electoral uh, sense, not at least in India. But does the voter care about civil liberties? They do, depending which class you're talking about. Not, n not necessarily those who are struggling to meet. You know, it's a survival versus right debate. Even in the developmental world, we hear this all the time. And, after, you know, there has been an enraging debate over the last two decades. And ultimately, experts all over the globe have come to the conclusion that, yes, rights important as they are, it cannot take precedence over survival. You cannot, cannot put right over survival. Cool. Can you get a mic to Liz over the back there? Uh, okay, you can give it first here, please. And then to Liz at the back, then the young gentleman in front of him. 
my question is very short and uh, sir if you could just introduce i know yeah i am bharat mehta my question is that before 2014 uh, there were couple of schemes that were started by the upa government and were opposed by bjp in general and uh, mr modi as the chief minister of uh, gujarat in particular things like uh, aadhar and uh, things sorry gst ha yeah gst these two strongly and run up to in run up to 2014 elections he used this as a strong instrument for opposing upa government but they have adopted the same schemes used it effectively and are showing as the their own uh, achievements in those things why has the voter not been able to understand as to why this shift has taken place and why the opposition parties have not been able to take advantage of this shift thank you sir first of all i do not uh, read it this, read the two examples you gave uh, in the same way look at aadhar much before aadhar was opposed by likes of mr modi or talked about in like a dissenting tone within the upf formation they were fighting and that was an issue between mr nandan and the home minister of that time so they themselves were not convinced whether they should have a national register or they should have aadhar you if you go and talk to mr nandan nilkarni and the whole people who were behind aadhar they were disgusted with uh, you know the confusion that prevailed mr modi they, he came and he saw the merit in it which unfortunately is not his uh, uh, his brain child but this shows the state of affair of opposition they had this tool in their hand they are the one who started but they were so confused they were not decisive mr modi has been decisive with aadhar and therefore he is benefiting from its use and universalization so i would not put it that voters are for voters aadhar was one of the schemes during upa one of the initiative which government was trying to do still not sure about it mr modi has come and said okay this is it your life depends on this so it's a completely different formation and when it comes to political opposition on not only on these two i can count another 10 things on which they would have opposed earlier but there is also merit in it sometime what looks uh, uh, an idea or a program that as a chief minister you are not uh, uh, supportive of as a prime minister your role is different i'm not trying to defend his u turns i'm just trying to tell you because if you are a not a you are a producing state like gujarat you you are bound to be more wary of gst because the consumption states are going to benefit more uh, uh, in gst but when you are a prime minister you are prime minister of both the manufacturing state as well as the consuming state so sometime it is the policy need is also there and little bit of political political shift of course there but aadhar i think it is a mess created by congress they it was one of the missed opportunity despite having the great idea they did not push it with the decisiveness that was needed and hence they paid the price and if you leave it whether it is toilet whether it is uh, uh, nal jal whether it is uh, aadhar there are so many schemes when opposition get up and say oh this was our initiative yes it was your initiative but you didn't do it at a scale you didn't do it in a manner you didn't convert it into a mass movement you didn't uh, do it in a manner which would have given you vote liz please is liz there yeah go ahead so voter is smarter sir <coughs> go ahead please is that is that mother kishan yeah please go ahead i'm a little out of turn but uh, you've given me the mic two questions my name is madhu kishwar um two questions one Uh, what you had to say to the growing criticism within the hindutva fold against modi's policies of tushtikaran triptikaran etc i see very shrill criticism coming do you think it has any worth weight value second it seems that while modi is very uh, militant in gobbling up chief ministers who buckle under pressure but anyone who stands up to him like mamta banerji he backs off the the first one is rather simple i have already said that directionally i see 
more and more say and voice and prominence of hardliners. So anyone who is incumbent would look less of a hardliner and hence what the comment which you are making. But that's the trajectory, ideological trajectory, which is driven or guided by some score philosophy and belief. So that is not function of, we saw it in the case of Bajpayee and Advani, when Mr. Bajpayee was seen as a liberal and there was a lot of the same thing, same sentiment against uh, Bajpayee when people were flag bearers of Mr. Advani. We saw the same thing happening between Mr. Adan, uh, Advani and Mr. Modi when those who were the flag bearers of Mr. Uh, Ad, uh, Advani started becoming the flag bearer of Mr. Modi, criticizing that he is not hard, hard enough. Similarly, this trajectory is moving in that direction more and more what she was talking about. Yogi's cult, that we need a bit more. It's like it's an ideological intoxication. You need a higher degree of, uh, I would say, uh, hardline talk and actions to keep the same level of effect. It's a proven thing in science. You know, it happens in liquor. What gives the 30 ml liquor, what gives you effect today, if you consume it one year, maybe you need to consume 45 ml to get the same effect. What was the second question, sorry? Oh, his ability to they, take the military. Backing I don't know if never uh, someone. It's, it has got nothing to do with Mr. Modi. Anyone who will stand up <coughs> has an space because uh, and can take on BJP because there is opposition on the ground. But you have to have the ability, the courage, the resource, the strategy to harness that. If you are not able to do it, then you will pay the price. Please, please. Hi. Sucking up to them. If I can say so, sucking up to them is not going to give you a result. You have to stand up. I think Mr. Nadda said this, that if just because you come and take a picture and call me four times or something, I, you're not going to be the, we are not going to appreciate. We know everything, what, that, that's what he claimed. But that kind of sums up their thinking, that uh, you have to stand up. If you are fighting, you have to stand up. It holds true for everyone. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Mr. Kisho, I just want to ask about your own plan. Uh, you've been saying that uh, you will form, a, you think about a political party after uh, assessing the ground situation, after, uh, you know, getting to know what the people want. But you have registered a party in uh, July 2020. Here comes the journalist. <laughs> yes. You have registered a party. Are, are you going to take up that party or uh, what is your plan with Jai Suraj party? See, first of all, the first state, the question is wrong. I have never said that I am out there in Bihar to assess whether people want a new party or not. I am, I have said that I am here in Bihar to assist people form a party because the data from Bihar is very clear. 55% people in Bihar have said in these many words that they are looking for a new alternative. What I am doing is exactly what I was doing with the political parties. I was advising political parties how to, how to f come together, how to build their organization, how to make it more effective, how to communicate, how to convert your support uh, into vote. Only the canvas has changed. Earlier I was doing it for the party and a leader. Now I am doing it for the society called Bihar. So, uh, as far as the party registered is concerned, I am aware that there are three individuals who have registered the name or a party with the same name called Jan Suraj, but I'm not the one who has started this. There are three individuals and I'm in talks with them. Uh, it happens even in the domain, if you block uh, a name, people take that domain and then they seek money from you or they seek some benefit or they want to be uh, some way recognized because we are doing the whole effort under the name of Jan Suraj. If somebody has the brand name Jan Suraj party, of course, he or she would have some leverage. And it's not that I have started a party. The young gentleman there, yes. But there will be a party, so make no mistake. The, we'll it's a stated goal, I've said it on 5th May 2021, that one of the goals of this whole Yatra and the whole effort is to help people of Bihar form a political party. And we remain committed to that. Okay, just the, if we keep the question short, please, and the answers also a little bit short, because I want to get through five more questions. Okay. Go ahead. Hello, sir. I'm Mahir. Uh, you mentioned Indraji twice or thrice while you were speaking, and you spoke about centralization of power. But I would want you, like, I want to know that about 40 to 50 percent of the voter base has not witnessed Indraji's era. 
So, do you think it is because they feel that this centralization of power, even though it's happening to the opposition, the opposition is not per se clean, I don't want to use the word corrupt, but, and it's because of that, that they are, you know, people are not voicing their opinion on this and they feel it is right, what the government is doing, yes, targeted towards the opposition, but yeah. No, again, this, your... Can I take a second question with it? No, you I will just fair? let him... I'll take let one more answer. question, yeah. please. please. Yes, please. The, the, the gentleman behind. Yes, please. Short question. Yeah. Uh, there was a question on Aadhaar. Sorry? Uh, there on was Aadhaar. a question on Aadhaar which was, yeah. There was a question on Aadhaar and I wanted to ask immediately after that, but I got the opportunity now. The predecessor of Aadhaar was a multi-purpose national identity card. The pilot, yeah, sorry. The pilot project uh, uh, started by Mr. L.K. Advani when he was the uh, uh, Home Minister or Deputy Chief Minister. Now, uh, after that, you know, when uh, the UPA government came, the same concept, similar concept was transformed into Aadhaar, um, minus the citizenship uh, provision. So the question, please. Now, the question is, why did not uh, the NDA government take up this uh, very beloved pilot project initiated by uh, Advani ji uh, into fruct uh, fructification rather than pursuing Aadhaar itself? Because multi-purpose national identity Thank card you. would have been much better in terms of its features in terms of usability. Thank you. Okay. The, coming to the first question of the young man, you know, it's not backed by data that those who have not uh, lived with the experience of the past centralization episodes of India are more oblivious to the centralization. If you look at the support base of Mr. Modi, it is actually now reverse in, going in reverse order. More, more young people, he's losing support base among the young He's consolidating more among the older lot. People who are consuming information more or less in an ecstatic manner through television, through WhatsApp groups, in the parks, in the news, through the newspapers and all. So over the last 10 years, Modi's charisma, approval rating and uh, support among the younger lot, 18 to 25, on relative basis has gone down while he has gained more trust and support among those who are above 50 and above so it's not supporting what you think is uh, you don't need to necessarily live the experience to learn from it or to take cognizance of it uh, sir your register thing I'm not a spokesperson of government to say why they have taken this or why they have not taken it probably what I know a little bit what mr. Advani has started or during his time he started was taken forward by mr. Chitambaram when he was the home minister UPA followed this two approach that register is too cumbersome so in the border facing state we will do go by the register we will do uh, cards uh, in uh, other states so they remain in dilemma Mr. Modi came and he said okay let's have one solution and he went for the card it's a judgment which anyone would do one way or other they have gone for the card and by large it's a sensible thing yes. to do question here please first Please. But coming back to the merit of this being multipurpose, I think there are already chatter that how Aadhaar could be linked to the, uh, you know, multipurpose card could be made and where the election ID and your PAN and Aadhaar all could be merged in one ID. So it's quite possible. Go ahead. Thank you. I am uh, CA Manmohan Kejriwal. Thank you for telling us to be uh, selfish uh, for our son as well as for our families. No, not for you. It was for the bottom pyramid. For you, I said, be more <laughs> conscious of those who don't have. <laughs> yes, go ahead, but, sir. But, 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 uh, but I said for you to be a more generous and <laughs> those who don't have to be more selfish. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you have always, uh, wherever you have supported the parties, your success ratio is always 100%. What, what I understand. Aap jase charismatic personalities ko, jo intelligent hai, strategist hai, kya rok raha hai, aap, aap jaldi se kyo nahi aate front pe, people, people like us, the whole society, whole country wants you to come forward and, and, chal rahe, sir. and Ek, lead, lead 24, us. 24 ghante ka din hai, aur usme jitna chal sakte, utna chal rahe, 15 kilometer. You have to understand one thing, lot of people come and say these things, not that I, that goal is there. It took almost 30 years and the likes of none less than Mahatma Gandhi for Congress to become a pan-India phenomena, political phenomena. 
30 years minimum. It took almost 30 years for Jansang to arrive and another 30 years to be Jansang to take a rebirth in form of BJP and another 20 years for them before they first became the coalition lead forming the government under the leadership of Mr. Bajpayee. You have to understand one thing. You're talking about 1.3 billion people, which is one-sixth of the humanity. So even if this 1.3 billion people need to know that there is a person called, God sent person called Mr. Kejriwal who can change our life, it takes time. It cannot be done overnight. So anyone who wants to do this has to have 15 to 20 years thing in the mind. And I said the same thing to Congress when I was talking to them. That you have a hundred year legacy, but you have to, they have no option but to reincarnate yourself. No re-strengthening and all. You have to reincarnate yourself and you have to have a 10 year plan and work towards that. There is no way you can do it uh, short term. You know, I, I said somewhere else, the opposition and their tactics are more like a day trader in the market. You know, who wishes that every day I will trade and I will make some money. But the history tells us that you never make money in day trading. You make money when you invest and stay there for 10 years, 20 years. Maybe the return comes one, one year later. But you're, temperamentally, you have to be a long-term investor. So you have to invest in the ideology, the formation, what you believe in, rather than keep changing every day. Today I'm going to go solo, tomorrow I'm going to have India Alliance, tomorrow I will go on Rafael, third day I will become Hindu. It's not going to give you result. Super. I think now we know the secret about your fitness, Prashant, that you're looking at 20... My fitness? I have yeah. become so unfit. I was just telling mm -hmm. Nandita ji that my doctor is advising that no more walking, <laughs> otherwise you'll have... You're looking problem. fit though. Okay. So I know a lot, lot more questions. Uh, so I, 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 I'll, I need to get to my rapid fire. I'll do that now. He's taking all the time for himself. And no, the no. rapid fires are the... No, like rapid if you do not get yours. the headline, get into the rapid fire. Because so, if my head will be tired, I'll say something that will create a headline tomorrow. Uh, well, well, we all headline hunters <laughs> at the end of the day. So, so I'll try this rapid fire. Then if, if he has time, we'll take a few more questions. I'm sorry, I know a lot of hands there, but I'm going to try the rapid fire first. And because you give me a great segue. You said about stock market. So the first rapid fire, the toughest one, and then they'll be a little bit easier. Um, if you were a stock picker and these politicians were stocks, <laughs> look, what are we who would you bet on? Who would you bet on? Should I give you a list or you want to tell me the five you would bet on? I would not. Okay, so I'll give you. Akhilesh, Aditya, Akhilesh Yadav, Aditya Thakre, Chirag Paswan, KTR, Jagan Reddy, Raghav Chadda, Omar Abdullah, Uday Nidhi Stalin, Abhishek Banerjee. Look what he ha he's mentioning. All potted plants. <laughs> See, he is wanting me to pick from 10 bad stocks, which is going to be the multi-bagger. <laughs> None. So you, so, you, so you give us your pick. Sorry? You give us your pick. Who's no, I, I, two or three I, stocks that you I, think... I, 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 don't know, I don't know the name, but uh, I will just uh, borrow something which I heard from Mr. Gates. He was asked this question some, when I was in UN, I, he was visiting uh, Africa and somebody like us, we would have asked that who will replace you as the richest person on the planet? And he said, I don't know who will, but I know for sure that the person who is going to replace me is not in the business today. Okay. Because if he would have been in the business, he, I would not have surpassed him. So what I see is... All the names, what you're saying, you're, it's like you're, it's the young, a, the young you're people, looking at the rear, yeah. uh, rear, it's not young or old. JP challenged uh, Indraji, he was not young. Okay. But he was not part of the dispensation, he was not one of the chief ministers or one of the political leaders. BP Singh, when he challenged Rajiv Gandhi, he was not, no, none of us could have predicted this in 85 that it will be BP Singh. Anna was, all, Anna Hajare was always there on the horizon till he emerged in one form and he, yeah. literally destroyed the credibility of UPA through the uh, uh, Anna yeah. Andolan. Yeah. So, we don't know if that was, I'm not saying by default it will be, it will be a new thing. You cannot sell okay. the old thing again and again. Okay, so is there one person who's not in politics today, who you think has a great opportunity in politics? Anyone, so, who, so any field, any, 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 anyone who is willing to put 12 hours and has a 10-year plan, has an, has an opportunity. What is as, as simple as this, including you. Okay. 
What is the number one weakness that no, I'm already there. I'm already in politics. <laughs> so I, I, I don't I don't fit the bill. Yes. The number one weakness that may hurt the BJP electorally. Over dependence on Mr. Modi uh, may not uh, hurt him today, but as it has happened in the case of Congress, over dependence on Indira Gandhi, the moment she went, all flaws are now uh, apparent to us that there was no organization, there was no decentralization, there was no second rung leadership, etc., etc. So long she was there dominating, winning, nobody talked about this. So over dependence on Mr. Modi is probably the greatest risk I see if I'm a BJP guy. And BJP after Modi, without, whenever that happens, at some point, do we, do you, is there somebody you think is likely to take that place? Today you can identify or will it be? I, 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 I have no wisdom on that. I just said that whoever comes will be more hardliner than what Mr. Modi is. And will it be, and will Nagpur decide or will the people decide? Sorry? Will Nagpur decide or will the people I have decide? no idea about these things. Okay. I'm sure it's, it's a BJP rank and file, the cadre, the key stakeholders will decide, put together. How Mr. Modi was decided? There was not one room uh, where everyone yeah. sat and came with Mr. Modi's name. It was a two, three years yeah. of grassroots thinking, talking, pressure building. That forced the stakeholders to sit together and recognize him as a leader. The one thing you've learned from Nitish Kumar? <laughs> Um, no, not you turn the, the ability to maneuver and uh, gain from the place of weakness is something which I would like to learn. He, he's very weak. He's, he doesn't have anything to back. Forget about this present, uh, presently what he has done. To remain chief minister of state as big as Bihar, as complex as Bihar, uh, the person, he has never worked from the position of his strength. In fact, once in his life he has worked, uh, tried to work from position of his strength, that was 2014 and he was reduced to two. So since then he has learned that, you know, some of these leaders, including Mr. Bajpayee, Narsimha Rao, these were the leaders who knew how to win from the position of weakness. So sometimes it is, in reality they are on the weak position and they also make you believe what we say, so everyone comes around, okay, he's a harmless guy. So it's an art and uh, a, a great uh, weapon to have. It's meant to, be, meant to be rapid fire, but I can't resist. Is there one story, one anecdote you can tell us that shows where he used position of weakness to his advantage? Because you, you, you stayed with him, you were like very, you know. Yes, was... yes, I did. <sighs> the very first time when he became Chief Minister, which uh, was much before uh, Mr. Modi, me or anybody else, uh, BJP was twice in terms of numbers uh, than uh, uh, Nitish Kumar yeah. and that time it was BJP who fought Lalu Yadav but uh, Mr. Nitish Kumar successfully persuaded or managed to convince the central leadership of BJP, uh, Mr. Bajpayee, Advani, Arun Jaitley all put together that uh, you know this caste bogey, he, he understands caste very well so he plays it very well. So he played that idea that only if you have an me, we, you have me, then I can manage the caste thing. Otherwise, the Mandal thing will not let BJP to kind of win the state. Uh, would you advise uh, state parties to push for caste census? Not at all. Okay. Uh, state parties, yes. National parties, no. Okay. Um, uh, I think Congress made a big mistake. Uh, Congress leadership is completely, I would say, ill-advised by uh, making this as a central issue. I, I, I've said this before and they've already paid price probably one of the reason was, you know, when you are a national party, uh, Lalu Yadav saying that there should be a caste-based census is one thing and Congress to say is a different thing. And they paid a heavy price to my mind in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh for overplaying this card, which again they would realize like it happened in Rafael, uh, Congress present leadership is overplaying this caste thing. It is only going to divide society, it will disturb their core support, whatever is left, and uh, it will not fetch okay. any incremental vote either. The one secret ingredient behind Naveen Patnayak's political longevity? Just remaining out of sight. So difficult to attack. So if you're not uh, visible, it's very difficult to attack. You tell me if you and I have to start, we want to attack you, uh, Mr. Naveen Patnayak, what do you attack him on? except for the fact that he's invisible. 
you don't attack him anything uh, because he doesn't give you anything okay in your it's just like when you're bowling you just ball on the sixth stump six stumps outside of of stump so there is no question of it just you you can't do anything but to leave the ball <laughs> let if, it go to the wicket keeper yeah. if mayawati today were to call you and ask you for advice what I would, would you i would say that i have retired Okay, but if if we're if we're reading Mayavati's book today, what chapter are we on? Where where do you because that that's one interesting personality who's. Uh, I'd say the last chapter is already written. The uh, the BSP uh, Andolan has been uh, killed, or rather traded, to become the chief minister, and this is what happens when you trade the long term goal with the short term gain. so bsp if it would have stayed the path i i am one of those who believe that this could have become one of the national parties in true senses but in or in in their pursuit to become the ruling party in in up they made too many compromises probably diluted the andolan of this dalit empowerment and a, a political party where dalits were the anusuchit jati they don't like to be called dalit anusuchit jati uh, scs are at the core that got diluted and hence the when there is no soul then body can last only that much if the bjp were to call you today for advice on 2024 will you accept their offer or no why would they call me first of all and even if they call why why would i go i have okay. left them long back okay which and i'm not it's not about bjp or bsp i have left that domain 2021 yeah. it just that you guys can't stop calling me uh, <laughs> um, the political estimate <laughs> I find the funniest thing is that I am called to talk about the entire politics of India. But if I say that in Bihar, Jan Suraj will do well, people say, "Oh, he doesn't know what what the politics of Bihar." No, I don't fact, know politics of Bihar, but I know politics of whole of India. What no, no, happened fact, to BSP, to BJP, to Lalu, to Rahul? But I don't know what is happening to Jan Suraj. And I find it very funny when journalists write this. I say there is no problem in them saying that I don't know about Bihar and politics. but the same journalists when they say that i know anything and anything and everything about politics in yeah. india that is contradictory but I, so make fact, up your mind what do you think if i know about politics of india i know a little bit at least of that of bihar 100% in fact i i must say i mean it was so much it was really enlightening to just watch his yes. interviews and conversations around bihar it was like something very it was very different way of looking at politics altogether so i must i must mention that in fact if you guys you must take the uh, go on youtube and type uh, you know uh, his conversation on bihar is very interesting okay uh, which institution is has a better finger on the population on the pulse of the nation rss or bjp any day rss okay um not because who they are it's just because the further away farther you are from the power better you are uh, uh, you are more likely to be uh, closer to what people think there is this line which i always say the hum log bacche mein padhte hain ki raja jab bhesh badal kar nikle to unhe pata chala this is a great line of wisdom hmm. no matter who is the king no matter how smart you are no matter how big is your tantra of data and information collection so long people know that you are a king you will never going to get the right information yeah tabhi to ye kaha jata hai ki ye raja jab bhesh badal kar nikle to unko pata chala ki praja ko ye dikkat hai and that's the challenge every person who sit on the chair he has and that is what this fancy word of anti incumbency all those who reach that position they have gone through the grind they have gone through bottom up only most of them they just at some point of time they get completely disconnected because everyone who comes they tell you only the right thing what you want to hear or even if you say that tell me the truth you'll say nahi sir sab to theek hi hai thoda sa ye lag raha hai zara sa isko dekh lijiyega yeah of all the people you've worked with who was the most challenging client nobody has been a client so i i never work i had never worked i i was a political aide I have never worked in this client relationship. Okay, Otherwise, I'm not, not client. Kind of, I mean, uh, you don't live with your clients. No, that's true. Okay, so of between Stalin, Mamta, Kejriwal, Jagan, Udhav, Nitish, and Amrinder, who was the who was it? Who, which 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 campaign was the toughest for you? Toughest was Punjab in 2017 uh, because it was with uh, Amrinder Singh and Congress, 
uh, which is uh, up against a rising force of AAP. A lot of people do not realize that what stunning success be AAP got this time, they would have got it in 2017 only, but for the campaign what we did. I, so I have said it before, I have said it immediately after the election. It was the toughest election. It not talked about much because it was not between Modi yeah. and Rahul and, you know, two national parties, but it was the toughest election to crack. Because when we started, Congress was somewhere around mid-20s and our Madhmi party was polling 50%. 50 and every day we used to go and look at data and say nothing is moving. And six months the needle didn't move. But there came an opportunity and we just literally, electorally we killed them. So it was tough. And out of all these names that I said, the people who you've worked very closely with, who's the one person you've learned the most from? I learned from everybody. My father has taught me one thing which has done great service to me, that whoever you meet, there, are, there will be always people who will look at the gaps. You look at what is his strength, why that person. So I have learned a great deal from Laluji, from Nitish, from Modi, every, everyone. We learn from, I'm nobody. I learn from everyone. Is the one big difference between Modi of 2019 and Modi of 2024? Oh, I told you, that in, in his own way, in 2019, he was somebody who is taking India to the greater glory. Uh, in 2014, in 2024, he is somebody who is bringing God to India. Identity or welfare? Which one of these is the more potent election weapon? Welfare. I think Never make this mistake. A bad govern government, no matter how much you play, whether it's Mandal, Kamandal, will not give you the vote. Okay. It, it, it will give you a, some vote, it will, it will not give you the victory. Unless you marry welfare with identity with something, welfare with something, it's not going to work. The one thing that needs to change in Dravidian politics? Dravidian politics? Yes. Ah, dependence on caste. Uh, it's a sad affair for some of the most prosperous and well-performing states. The influence of money in politics is far greater and uh, worrisome than what it is in northern India. So elections in Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, to some extent now in Maharashtra also, are becoming so expensive and the, the, kind, the money which we hear and see, it's just unimaginable. An MP, uh, a member parliament in uh, Tamil Nadu, the, the money which they spend, probably that money is good enough to fight the whole state in, in North. It's, it's, it's sad. If you were today to predict how many seats for BJP, how many seats for NDA? I would never do that. I never, never do, do this. That. I, know, I, was I would never do this. I would say that <laughs> as of now, um, Modi led NDA or BJP uh, is, they have a significant advantage. They are well, well ahead. It would take something unthinkable in next two months for their gains to reverse. Okay. It's not easy. Last question, rapid fire, then if you have time, we'll take audience anymore. Is there anything Prashant Kishore is afraid of? I'm afraid of… Prashant Kishore is afraid of? I'm afraid of getting up in the morning and uh, realizing that my brain is not working. Uh, I'm very scared of this brain stroke. So, uh, okay. so if I'm not able to think, uh, that, that, that's something which really scares me. That's a very morose, very <laughs> morose way to end the rapid fire. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll take one last question. Is that okay with you? One last yeah, question. Yeah, you, you can keep. Please, yeah, the lady there has had her hand up for about twenty minutes. So I just want to, please, yeah, please introduce yourself. But keep the question short, please. We're really Sir, out of time. Uh, there's two gentlemen here. No, I'm sorry. I mean, there's not my eye view. Yes, one from there as well. In the meanwhile, maybe the gentleman here can get the mic. Hello. Uh, don't you think Jan Suraj campaign started a bit late? Uh, additionally, in your campaign objectives, you mentioned uh, the importance of uh, identifying the right people uh, at the grassroots level. How do you plan to identify them? Who, according to you, are the right people as such? And furthermore, if you could please uh, like provide some insights upon Bharat Jori Yatra, do you think that uh, it would benefit the opposition? Well, I, uh, who am I to comment about whether Bharat Jodo Yatra has benefited opposition or not? Definitely, if you do that kind of massive public outreach, it will do some good to you. L make no mistake, no matter whoever is doing. That kind of effort would have resulted into 
doing some good to Mr. Rahul Gandhi or Congress or opposition as, as a whole. But whether that incremental gain is, was sufficient enough for them to win election or not, data is out there. Of course, they, it did not help them in states like Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh. It did help them, say, in Telangana or Karnataka, where there was a machinery and the operators and there was an anti-incumbency to, uh, to capitalize on. So it's a combination of, see, public outreach per se is b guaranteed to give you result. But that result is not necessarily election victory because elections are not only goodwill for you, but public outreach, a sincere one, uh, ha uh, where you put hard effort will definitely give you goodwill and support. There is no two way about it. To that extent, Rahul Gandhi would have benefited. Whether that is good enough for Congress to win has got many other variables as well. To, to your this, question so of you whether Jan Suraj, we have started late, I didn't know why. What do you mean by started late? Uh, whenever I, I, I thought that I am now convinced and I have the ability to uh, stay true to my commitment and spend three years, four years, five years, whatever it takes to make this happen, I have taken the call and I, now I am doing what needs to be done. The, would the Congress have benefited more if the Yatra was being walked by Priyanka and not Rahul? No. It, 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 it is just not... Congress, again, the elections are different thing. Public outreach, public engagement, yatra or through other means is a different ball game. You can have a lot of goodwill for you. The Tamil yeah. Nadu, West Bengal, these are the states where you would have seen Rajiv Gandhi's rally probably bigger than what he would get in UP or Bihar. But Congress was not successful in those states. Okay. Please. Yes, gentlemen. Election victory is not only a function of how many people are coming in your rallies and how many people you are talking and are a fan of yours. Yes. Uh, namaste Prashanji, Namaste all. So this is further to the San, Jan Suraj Abhiyan, which you have already started and I come from Bhagalpur. So I've definitely learned a lot about that it is being recognized as a force coming through. Now my question is that in 2015, where, uh, 2025, where you are very likely to go for the state polls or the assembly elections, would you, suppose if you do not pull the numbers required, would you side with any of the RJD or the, the JDU the, or the, the BJP? The question report? doesn't arise. I answer this question on daily basis in Bihar. Jan Suraj, what I'm doing there is not merely one more party formation to fight or contest election. I'm guided in my, uh, what I'm doing in Bihar is what Mahatma Gandhi did in Champaran. Champaran did not give us per se the freedom. It gave us the tool called Satyagraha that was used in subsequent years, whether it was a non-cooperation or civil disobedience, and the whole country knew that this is a new tool through which you can take, you can fight petitioners and defeat them. So what I'm trying to do in Bihar is to take that hypothesis on the ground and test it in politically, socially most compli complex state. And if I'm able to prove it, then scalability becomes easy. It would no longer be seen as a Bihar-based regional effort because you'd realize that if it is possible in Bihar, then certainly it, it is doable in Maharashtra. So that's the whole idea. So the question of any alliance, seat, winning, losing, doesn't matter. If it takes 10 years, I will stay true, true to, uh, to this idea for 10 years. It may take 10 years, it may take 15 years, but I'm not coming back. I'm not diluting it. I'm not diluting so it. Is your endeavor is not a political movement? Uh, I don't believe in movements. I always say I'm, I'm one of those who, uh, who think that movements, uh, as they say, Andolan and Kranti, they don't go, do good to the society. The human history tells you that no uh, Andolan or Kranti, no revolution, but for an exception or French revolution has ever done good to the humanity. Andolan or Kranti are like a, a weapon through which you can remove the incumbent. Anna Andolan hua apne sarkar hiladi, JP Andolan hua Indraji ko hata diya. But that is not, it's, it has got no creative element to it. Jo srijan hai uska aik apna time, it's a slow burn, it is a slow process. So what I am doing is not, I am not trying to remove somebody from the power in Bihar. I am trying to educate, empower and bring people together that you can do this. And that is, to my mind, is what Gandhi's preaching is. Gandhi never did an Andolan 
इन फर्स्ट थर्टी फोर्टी ईयर्स की चलो आज ब्रिटिशर्स को हटा देते हैं ही सेट कि अपने कपड़े खुद बनाओ जातिवाद मत करो अपना लेटरिन खुद साफ करो सो अनलेस यू बिल्ड दो वैल्यूज आई डोंट थिंक यू वुड बी एबल टू आंदोलन इज जस्ट इट्स मोर लाइक ए घी की आग खाना जो है वो लकड़ी की आग पे बनता है घी की घी आग अगर एक ड्रम भी ला के जला दें उससे खाना नहीं बना सकते Okay, I think we should. Uh, uh, Prashant is being generous with his time, but I think we are running out of time. Short question. Take one. I'm also seeing Iqbal there at the back. He's come from Bombay, so I'm going to ask him if uh, you have any comment. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Adnan Ali from uh, Jamia Millia Islamia Education CRC, and my question is that uh, in whole conversation, you didn't take, uh, talk about the uh, Aam Aadmi Party. So, uh, um, uh, this is the first election uh, when Aam Aadmi Party contest as a national party. So, do you believe that Amadmi Party make any uh, difference in 24 results? No. The last, the you know, last some, of, some, why, of you, why, some, why you some of you guys, well, you are a young person. Amadmi Party is one member party, Lok Sabha. Just be objective. You need to grow 200 times in two months. Is it possible? In two years, it's possible. How smart you have to be to grow 200? Times in two months, you are saying it's a national party. It's a technical thing. National but in twenty years, but in twenty years, you believe that it's a, because you know they, they want no, the it's not, not, not anti Hindu. Not, 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 not even in twenty years because they do not have what I call ideological and institutional rooting of any kind that make them distinct from BJP or Congress. So Generally. they don't have the legs to stay true. For next 20 years and short run, they, what they have been attempting to do, they failed in 2014. They were butchered in 2019, and I don't see them doing anything very different, drastically different at national level. In the process, they have become one more party in India. They are no longer have that distinct thing that we are a party with a difference. They have become one more party, like there are 300 other parties. Okay, you want to take one last one, right? There's a last one, please. Yeah, Good hi, Prashant. My name is Chanakya. So I want to ask. Your name is Chanakya. <laughs> <laughs> so, salute to your parents. Yeah, yeah. So, I want to ask two short questions. That do you think that what Rahul Gandhi currently doing right now, it will bring success in next ten years? Because what he did south to north, and now he's doing east to west. What L K Advani ji did a Rath Yatra today, the B J P got success of that after a long time. Do you think Rahul Gandhi can do that after? After 10 years, do you think this yatra will do fruitful to that? And my second question is that when Prashant Kishore is joining Congress, because you have said in one of your interview that your ideology matches with Congress, and after Lok Sabha elections, the Congress has to take a call. What will be the role? Well, you are putting, uh, you are just distorting a little bit my words. I said I was asked the ideology, and I said that my ideology is closer to what Congress. claims to represent today so there's a difference but yes if it you have to bind me to that i would certainly put myself more on the left of center than right of center so to that extent i am closer to what congress is claiming or is supposed to represent in ideological terms the first question you said what rahul gandhi yatra will do i think just tactically speaking this is the worst decision uh, on part of him to this purely from the timing point of view you you are the commander of the army you don't leave your headquarter when your entire battalion is at war you do visit sometime you don't leave the headquarter if you wanted to do yatra you know lk advani did not do yatra two months before elections this is the time when he should be at the headquarters rather than him being in manipur so it's just common sensical thing i sometime you know uh, i find this uh, very amazing that who advises these people and how they take call they certainly they are much more experienced and smarter than us but i just don't understand this logic behind it uh, 10 years yes if he continues this path he completely erases the elections in between but you have to be alive to fight 10 years as in economics they say in long run everyone is dead Okay, Prashant ji, thank you so much for thank your time. You. Thank really, you. Thank you very much. Be two hours on a cold winter morning. I think very few people could have held the crowd like you did. Thank, thank you so you. much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kishore. Thank you, Vandita. Thank you, Anand, for this insightful conversation. Uh, may now invite Mr. Rajkumar Jha. 
Chief Editor, The Indian Express, to present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Kishore. This illustration is uh, created by our illustrator, Shubhajit Day. Thank you everyone for being such a patient audience. Uh, I'll take a moment to thank our partners. Uh, presenting partners, Religare Enterprises Limited. Associate partners, Bagries and Diwans. Hospitality partner, Le Meridian. Do stay back and join us for some tea and snacks. Thank you.